it helps that we had that conversation about um, abstract feature spaces when we were talking about encoding models, because actually we can start back with that framework, the same framework that we had here before. Let's say that there are popular neurons that encode your experiences of the world in a space of features. So this could be the V1 population well modeled by the theory one, or for these purposes it's going to mostly be um, ventral temporal cortex, which is um, sensitive to things like oh, categories, is it a house, is it a scene, is it a body, right? So the ventral temporal cortex. In the space of the true features that neurons respond to, if you think about a set of experience, like me looking around this room, then we can think of the representation in my ventral temporal cortex in the space of those features. So let's say those features are potted plants, and crowd of people, and the door. They're kind of, you know, proxies for the feature space of ventral temporal cortex. Yes? OK, so as I look around the room, then my, you can think of the experience in my ventral temporal cortex, the representation in those neurons, following a trajectory in the space of the features that it represents. Because when I start, I'm looking at a plant, so I have high values on my plant features and low values on everything else. And then I move to looking at a crowd of people, so I have high values in my crowd of people features and low values and everything else. And then I look at the door, so now I have high values in my door features and low values and everything else. So as I have a visual experience, there's a trajectory of my neurons in the feature space that they use to represent the world. Other neural populations will have other feature spaces, also trajectories, but different. Is that an OK way of thinking about this? Say you could record from all those voxels in my brain. OK? So my voxels. Each of the voxels in my ventral temporal cortex samples from the feature space of ventral temporal cortex. So there's some trajectory in my ventral temporal cortex, the space of voxels, that's the consequence of this, of my visual experience mapped into the visual features that ventral temporal cortex neurons represent, and then the way that those neurons are sampled in the voxels that you're recording from my ventral temporal cortex. If you were recording from my medial prefrontal cortex, the features would be different. So the trajectory in voxel space would be totally different, right? Presumably related via nonlinear mappings. That's what Stefano works on. So different feature spaces will lead to trajectories that are not simple to relate to one another. And the problem of relating the, the trajectory in the feature space of V1 to IT to medial prefrontal cortex, that's a really hard problem. But on the assumption that you and I have approximately similar ventral temporal cortices, because we're humans, and, and maybe a few other assumptions, like we are all sighted humans, and I don't know what other assumptions you need. We're all adults, right? So under a few assumptions that say the features that our neurons encode in the visual world are similar features. My ventral temporal cortex extracts similar features of the world to your ventral temporal cortex then we can assume that the same feature space that my voxels sample from, your voxels also sample from. Now, voxel 6 in you and voxel 1 in me, how do we know those two are related? That's a hard problem. They're certainly not sampling exactly the same way from the same, same neurons, right? It would be nearly impossible to get them to sample exactly the same neurons in you and, as in me. Here's the idea. My brain. So first, we use an anatomical mapping. This is something we talked about yesterday, right? To a template brain. Normalization that we talked about yesterday. So that our brains are pretty close to aligned. Right? Once we've mapped both of our brains into the anatomical template, then the bottom of our temporal lobes are more or less aligned. They're probably aligned within a centimeter, maybe even within half a centimeter, right? So it's reasonable to assume that voxels in the ventral temporal cortex of my brain and voxels in the ventral temporal cortex of your brain are now aligned approximately. 
But it's not reasonable to assume that voxel to voxel, they are sampling from the same features, right? So they're part of the same population, we might hope, but not, esti not estimating exactly the same features. If that was the case, then this suggests a solution. Take the voxels in you and the voxels in me that we know are sampling from the same population first. And then figure out how to rotate basically this and this into the common feature space. So each of these is sampling from a shared feature space. And the problem is to figure out the relationships. It's actually not going to go into this space. It's going to go into voxel space. So figure out what is the common dimensional structure that we can rotate each of our trajectories into so that what might be one voxel in you might be a combination of three voxels in me. Right? If one voxel in you is really well aligned with the potted plant feature, but in me, three of my voxels sample from that potted plant feature. That's fine, right? But the potted plant feature is present in both of our data sets. Is the idea clear? And so what we're going to try to do is find rotations of both of our data into some common dimensional structure where once we've done those rotations, they are as similar as they can possibly be. So when they do this, they take, so they, here is Haxby, this paper. I will give you the reference for it. First paper about this is et al. 2011. And the way that they propose that you should do this is a Procrustes transformation, which is rotation and reflection. Um, on the data preserving the full dimensionality until you get the best fit you can, and then dimensionality reduction in the common space. Um, so they don't assume that we have the same dimensionality, but they do assume you will do the best job of capturing the true dimensionality if you fit the data with all the dimensions in the data. So, so you do the rotations with all the dimensionality you have. What they say is this solution, the solution after we've rotated all of our brains into the most common space possible, is a mapping of the shared dimensional structure across multiple people's brains. And then you can map voxels from each person at common space, right? or, or the other way around. Right? There's now a mapping from each of us into a space of the dimensions of the features that our voxels are responding to. So we can now think of each of our voxels as a weighted function of the shared features. No, no, that's the whole point. Normalized space gives you the voxels that you think are a population. And this then offers a new mapping between our voxels. So once we've defined which voxels count as a population, one voxel in you over here could turn out to be most similar to one voxel in me over there. And in fact, commonly, the mappings won't be one to one. So we're not trying to find a one to one solution for at the scale of voxels, but rather for each of our voxels, we're going to think of those voxels as samples in the space of the common features. So now your voxel 7 might mostly sample from the potted plant dimension, and my voxel 1 might mostly sample from the crowd of people dimension, right? But for each of the voxels in our ventral trumpal stream, we have a mapping into the, di the dimensions of the features that we both represent. In order for this mapping of ventral temporal cortex to be general and complete, this trajectory should have sampled as much of this feature space of visual ventral temporal cortex as possible. Right? The more of the feature space you have traversed, the more when you, when you match those trajectories, you're really capturing the stuff that these voxels respond to.
And so what they say in the paper is to get a reasonable sample of all the features that ventral temporal cortex might respond to, as a representative sample of vision, we used Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay? So that's the reasonable sample of vision. The whole so all the participants watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders of the Lost Ark presumably traverses the space of features of things you might see in Indiana Jones movies. That trajectory you then align across people, right? So again, you can think about the shape of this curve, like when I went like this, right? There's a temporal structure, and that is like, now it's Indiana Jones' face. Now it's an explosion. But that temporal structure happens in the same order for all of us. So whatever happens in my brain, face, explosion. Something happens in your brain, face, explosion. There's some rotation that relates those to each other because of the combined temporal structure of the movie. And because a lot of different things come on the screen in Indiana Jones movies, we can assume, it is Indiana Jones, right? Raiders of the Last Doc. We can assume that we traversed a bunch of the feature space of ventral temporal cortex. Okay. And the way that they tested that was actually MVPA classification. So what they said is, if we have done a good job aligning voxels into a common feature space, then if we train on a classification in one subject, um, animal species. Okay. So we're going to hyper, we're going to align voxels based on Raiders of the Lost Ark. Then. Subjects are going to see pictures of different animal species. But now, instead of training in one set of my data and testing on one set of my data, I'm actually going to train in a set of Todd's data and test whether I can classify animal species in my data by mapping voxels through this common feature space. And what they showed is that if you just use anatomical alignment, so you try to get our voxels aligned based on an anatomical template, you can't do this. So you can train in Todd's data and test in Todd's data, animal species, and you can train in my data and test in my data, but the correspondence of voxels is poor, and so you can't train a model in Todd's voxels and test them in my voxels to define animal species in the anatomical space. But after you've mapped us both into this shared feature space, so now we have a common feature space of voxel responses, now you can do just as well training in Todd's data and testing in my data as training in Todd's data and testing in Todd's data for just classifying animal species in left out test data. And that was their test that hyperalignment had worked that once you had mapped voxels from within a population into this shared feature space, then you could relate voxels, individual voxels across brains, well enough to let you train in one person's brain and test in another person's brain, even a relatively subtle classification like which animal species. Neither specified nor extract. All they do is they take the trajectory across people and in the space of voxels, knowing that they're seeing the same movie, and rotate one set of voxels until it matches the other, so until the trajectory matches the other as best as possible. So that's one nice thing about this procedure, is that it doesn't require you to know anything about the feature space. You could then try to discover the feature space or have hypotheses about the feature space or whatever you wanted. But if you don't yet know anything about what the feature space is, all you need to know is that it's shared. And then you can do this. But there is a question here about what is necessary or sufficient as the set of experiences you have to get a set of voxels well aligned. Although you don't have to know anything about the features, the more of them you sampled the better, the better you will do when you align voxels inside that feature space. And so they started with a whole two-hour movie. And then now there's a question, do you need a two-hour movie? And what sets of things might one movie as opposed to another movie measure in terms of the feature space? Right. So in our lab, we know that if you watch Pixar's Partly Cloudy, a particular six-minute movie,
one thing that you experience a lot of is physical harm to the body. There's a lot of that in Partly Cloudy because baby alligators are biting the heads off storks. And so that feature space is sampled a lot. And that would then show up, importantly, in the feature space of voxels. And so that would then be something you used, importantly, to hyperline. Presumably, not all movies involve quite as much physical pain. And so if your movie happened not to involve that feature space, that would not be emphasized in the, alignment, the hyperalignment that you did between subjects. And then maybe you would turn out not to be able to classify that because your voxels weren't aligned based on that feature. Any question you were going to answer in a whole brain analysis, you would be better off answering when your voxels are aligned than when they are not aligned, right? So if the only question you were going to ask was some univariate contrast in the whole brain, you should still do that on voxels where voxels are aligned to each other with shared functions than when they aren't. And again, that's sort of what ROIs were supposed to be for, right? If one person's FFA is here and one is here, that instead of averaging across the FFA and the not FFA, first align them by calling them the FFA and then average. So hyperalignment is the generalized version of that intuition that before brain analyses, let's get voxels aligned to each other that have the same function. Right, having said that, I've had a whole career in which I didn't make any claims really based on whole brain group analysis particularly. Um, so you have to be, for some reason or another, planning to do whole brain analyses for this to be interesting. This doesn't test the hypothesis that there is a shared feature space. The whole morning and early afternoon on MVPA and encoding models and decoding models, that's how you test that there's a feature space and how much of the variance you can explain with that feature space. And if you want to know, does feature space explain more variance in one person than another? That's all from encoding and decoding models like we had this morning. This assumes there is a feature space and uses it for a purpose. Because if you were then going to ask the searchlight problem, you would do much better in a whole brain searchlight if you had hyperaligned than if you had it. Because the voxel where the information is would be aligned as opposed to not aligned. You can reverse this to get a spatial mapping so that voxel 1 that has some function is now spatially aligned to voxel 6 that has the most corresponding function. We'll do that all the time. Yeah, and this would definitely increase your power to say there's some place that has information about something because you would align those voxels that have that same feature. A, a lot of the time people build a model in an individual and classify in an individual. And if you're in an ROI, then when you want to go to do statistics across individuals, you do it within the ROI in each subject and then you get one statistic at the end. But if you're doing a searchlight in each individual, then when you end up doing statistics across individuals, you're doing it on the whole brain map of the searchlight. And then if in each individual you found classification but in slightly different places, then the statistics on your searchlight would find nothing, even though each map that went into that, that statistic was a searchlight that had found something but in slightly different places, which is the standard brain alignment problem that fMRI has always had when you were trying to do group analyses in a whole brain space. So this is the general form of the idea. In addition to saying that brains should be aligned anatomically, you should use functional information so that when you say that one voxel is measuring the same place in two different people, it's not just that it's as similar as it can be to sulcal and gyral landmarks, but also that it's as similar as it can be in some functional space. Yeah. So for any question where you wanted to do a whole brain group analysis, I think it's very likely that hyperalignment would make whatever next thing you were going to do way more sensitive and therefore more powerful. And so, right, in the baby Nears case, you could totally imagine doing a version of this, right? So if you the the version in Nears would be much lower res, which would basically be like which channel in the next person is most similar to this channel in this person, right? But it would let you say Across a set of 20 babies, we picked one channel, namely the one most similar to this trajectory across this movie. And then whatever we were going to do next, we did in the channel selected by that criterion. Right? That would be a way of doing it. And so, but instead of that criterion being a t-test, that criterion would be similarity to a trajectory over time. That's the simple version as, as applied to Nears. You probably wouldn't do...
mappings because you're so far away by the time you're in the next channel. No, you can, so what they said is look, uh, these mappings into the common space, you can then just pick a sample brain and map them back into space. So there's a way to translate this back into a spatial representation, and then all the normal visualization applies. Yeah. Um, in the first paper, what they did is mapped everybody's data into subject one's functional space. Um, and then they were like, yeah, that sort of prioritizes subject one in a weird way. So let's kind of have an average subject and map everybody into that average subject space. But it, it can be translated into a spatial map. In a, everybody's data gets mapped into that space, the, the spatial version of the abstract space. OK. Well, then you've learned everything you need to know about <laughs> fMRI analysis. So good luck, and see you next year. <laughs> Woo!